Thank you. So time to first, a last wrinkle it is. This is going to be, yeah, my thing. Um, so we had a wonderful, wonderful couple of days. And I want to just give a huge uh, shout out to MCs and also to organizers for making a wonderful, wonderful, fabulous event. So if you could join me in applause, I think that would be in order. And so I was thinking quite a lot about how it would be, like how to close the conference and how it would go and what I should share, because it feels like every single speaker who was speaking uh, over these two days like, said everything that you need to know about performance. I looked into third-party scripts, we looked into metrics, we looked into performance culture and everything in between. So what am I here to say? Um, well, I'm coming with peace, but I'm coming from the UX side into the web performance world. And I was studying a lot how people think, how people touch, how people tap, how people click on mobile devices this year. And especially, I was, as I was working with the European Parliament, I spent also quite a lot of time thinking where GDPR is coming from, this entire privacy discussion, the cookie pop-up, where is it coming from, and how can we make it better, right? And so today, what I want to share with you are some, some kind of insights that are mostly user-centric, but looking at the web performance as how we know it today. And for that, we kind of need to look first into where we stand. What is the state of things? Right? And essentially, the state of things is quite complicated and it's very fragmented, but let's try to nail it down. Now, we have 7.6 billion people around the world at this point. That's a lot of people. Uh, 5.6 billion people are an addressable market that we might want to address. Uh, 3.5 of them are using an active smartphone. Now, out of them, we have approximately 24% using an Apple at this point, and 76 using an Android. Right? Now, how much time do people spend on these phones, though? How much time do you spend on a phone? Just looking at the screen. <laughs> too long, maybe, maybe too much? Uh, it used to be that we were spending three hours, now we're moving towards four hours, and it looks like as we're moving forward, we're heading towards five hours a day, which also, according to the other data, means that as we, you know, take our phone and put it from our pockets to look at it, and put it back, we do it approximately 80 to 90 times a day which translated to the amount of time that we sleep, how much time do you sleep on a given day? Maybe eight hours, maybe a little bit less than that. Uh, it depends on the country. So if you happen to live in France, you'll be sleeping more. If you happen to live in South Korea, you'll be sleeping less. And as we're moving forward, it looks like we're actually sleeping less. So approximately every 10 to 12 minutes of our existence, we take a phone from our pockets, look at it, and put it back every 10 to 12 minutes. Now, what kind of phone is it then? Well, as we know, it's probably one of those, Moto G4, maybe it's Nokia S1, maybe it's Alcatel One X, right? And as also Tatiana mentioned, and also as um, Tim mentioned, most of these phones are not going to be great. They're definitely not the phones that we have in our pockets, right? So if we look at the performance of those phones, obviously we know that most of them, almost all of them, will be 12, 12 to 15 times slower, but they're also 12 to 15 times cheaper, which is kind of fair, I guess, right? So in that regard, when we're looking into performance, right, we're looking into how people interact with the sites, so this is the experience that most of these people we are go we're going to endure. Uh, this is a uh, you know, video by Dios Money, it's been around for quite some time, but once we look into how heavily optimized websites that we're creating and building and deploying and designing, they have no chance in countries like Indonesia. They have no chance in Brazil or Venezuela, as we learn today, because they're way too slow, and the architecture that we're providing is just not good enough. Now, we might think that technology is going to save us. After all, we have 5G coming up, and 4G has kind of made a really significant jump, and it's spreading as well. But in fact, if we look into 5G, yes, it looks incredible, right? We should be expecting anywhere from 100 megabit to 10 gigabit per second as speed. That's quite incredible, and it's 10 to 100 times faster, according, of course, uh, if you look in uh, what we're told by providers. But at the same time, that means, you know, just to translate it, that if you wanted to download one episode of Game of Thrones within, uh, in 4K, it would take us 90 seconds, or 1080p, 35 seconds, so the entire season in 15 minutes, right? And this, are kind of the, this is kind of the data that's coming up, or that's coming in from providers. Um, essentially, the speeds are, of course, quite remarkable. Right? Uh, at the same time, when we look into the forecast of what is going to happen in Europe, for example, we should be expecting by 2025 or so, kind of a really slow increase in what we should be expecting in terms of 5G adoption. And in fact, we see these rollouts kind of coming up already, where we uh, have kind of the 5G hitting the markets in pretty much consistently around the world. Right? But 
at the same time, it doesn't mean that things are going to get better. In fact, if you look into Scott Jail's post, we might be in a much worse world than we used to be um, in the past. Now, why is that? Now, if we look into this curve, the adoption of 4G over the last years, and as well, you know, 3G is, of course, everywhere, um, we see this little red bubble here, right at the bottom, right? Now, if you think about the next prediction of what's going to happen with 5G, it's probably this curve looks very similar to this curve, doesn't it? Hmm. That means that as we go from 4G to 5G, we should be also expecting a lot more JavaScript coming our way as well, which means that we probably will see a huge boost in how 5G is going to affect web performance. Not necessarily in a good way, because we can send more data. And as we know, of course, we can mobile and desktop, most of the time we'll be sending the same amount of data, so that's a big problem. And so when we look into JavaScript overhead, between 2011 and 2019, 4G coverage spread from 5% to 79, but then with JavaScript transfer size and mobile, we had an increase by 611% and 706% by third-party scripts. And we think, no, things are going to get better because we have HTTP free and quick, right? And they will get better, yes. Um, and of course, as Patrick also mentioned, there are a couple of issues with HTTP2 which are kind of being resolved in HTTP3. But at the same point, we should not be expecting like 20 or 30 or 40 percent improvement, although it seems like we're in a pretty good state. I mean, at least when I was switching to HTTP3 because it's backwards compatible, right? So we should be in a good shape anyway. And in fact, if you start looking to YouTube, for example, you'll find the protocol HTTP2 plus quick. 46, kind of showing up there as well. And one of the really cool features, of course, is the zero round trip time, which you should be expecting over quick. Um, and of course, we have, uh, it's fully encrypted by default and all of that, which is really, really nice, but it looks like, you know, it's not going to really make things much better, although it will make things better, right? But the problem is really different. The problem is that if you look into the amount of data being used or consumed every year, every single year we have an increase of 145% of data that's being used. And that's quite a lot of data because we like apparently Netflixing and chilling and stuff. Um, but that also means that if we look forward in the next five years or so, we should be expecting a magnificent or really strong change in how much data we're consuming. So as of right now, well, most people, like in the world, if you look at the average here, we have 5.3 gigabyte per week, or per, sorry, per month that we're using, uh, and we're going to jump to 24. In North America, we should be expecting the jump from 10 gigabyte of data to 56 gigabyte of data being used. Now, that's a significant amount of data that's going to go for the networks, and also if you look into the people who are going to come to the web for the very first time, this is not going to be North America, and it's not going to be Europe. Most of the time, we're looking into Asia Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, Latin America, and a little bit of Northern America and Europe, right? And in fact, the countries that will be dominating the web, as we know it, are not the countries that we're kind of used to, maybe. Specifically, if we look into this uh, report by Mobile Economy 2019, China, but it's locked down in a way, right? Um, India, Indonesia, USA, Brazil, Russia, which is also in a really bad path to being locked down, very much like China at this point. Um, Japan, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and of course Europe makes a part of it, but we're looking to very different newcomers to the world. And then we have another thing coming up, which is what Ilya was mentioning. We have 4K, we have 5K, we have 5, uh, um, 8K coming up, and we're expecting 60 frames per second gaming in the browser. How can we make that happen, right? Now, when you look into people and how they use the web, when we look specifically into how fragmented the web is, uh, one thing that we should mention is that it's never obviously uh, kind of normalized. Right? So what we see, that even if you look into Europe, we'll see that in Bulgaria, the 4G adoption is much weaker, much slower than, let's say, Norway, right? or let's say in Switzerland. And at the same time, even if we look into places where it's supposed to be pretty good, right, we'll find out that it really depends. Sometimes mobile is faster, sometimes Wi-Fi is faster. So it's extremely inconsistent, and the entire like, mobile experience is extremely fragmented. Now, looking into the state of web performance today, on the one side, we have really cool things, right? We have incredible browser compatibility. Now, I remember the times when the web didn't exist. Anybody remembers the times? Not that many, actually. Not that many. Uh, and so, you know, all the pain we had to go through in the past is mostly gone, which is pretty cool. We have incredible browser engines, rendering engines, JavaScript engines, incredible. Tooling has never been better. APIs, metrics, incredible stuff. Code spacing, tree shaking, all the wonderful things that make us help 
help us make things faster and better. And then we also have really nice front-end kind of techniques coming up, like, say, pre like we have pre-rendering, we have rehydration, and also static strategy now with Jamstack. Uh, and on top of that, of course, resilience. Finally, with service workers, progressive web apps. It's cool stuff, it's incredible. I mean, if you think about the state of technology today, it's just a groundbreaking, right? And then on top of that, 5G, Quick, Broadly, WebP, AV1, right? All these kind of wonderful things floating around. But then, what did we do with it? Well, we ended up with a lot of polluted and bloated websites serving a lot of CSS and JavaScript with a massive cost of third parties, right? Heavy, extremely heavy mobile fragmentation. And then looking into 4K, 5K, 8K, uh, the amount of data, the hunger for data is coming up, it's growing, so we kind of have to deal with it. And we are, we're dealing with it on devices that are not high-powered devices, right? We're kind of living somewhere in the low range or middle range, right? And then also, you know, I spent a lot of time in European Parliament this year uh, and last year, and if you have to deal with legacy, a lot of legacy, it's just, first of all, it's no fun, as you know, but second of all, you can't use all these fancy technologies and all the fancy things that we haven't left. Right? So that's kind of a really, really sad state of things. And beyond, on top of that, we have a lot of privacy issues and a lot of accessibility concerns. I ran a poll just a month ago about accessibility and how people see the role of accessibility and has it improved over the last five years. I was not very surprised to find out that most people think that it didn't change much at all. Right? Now, obviously, the performance and our work has been remarkable, but we still have a lot of work to do. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means that one of the most critical things we have to adopt and find out how to deal with it is this notion of adaptive serving that we covered already, right? Where we really have to think from the designer's perspective as much as from the developer's perspective of how we're going to serve different experiences, the different classes of devices with different connectivity, different memory, and also different kind of hardware that we're going to send to, right? And so I think we often look into only two things, maybe connectivity, right? That's one of them, and then again, the viewport. But there are many other dimensions that we haven't explored yet. Right? Um, data mode, of course, one of them. Privacy and stability settings is another. Now, of course, we can learn how to really deal with performance. Um, we have best practices, and we really, actually, I would say that we're pretty good at things of, in terms, in theory, of what we're supposed to do. And so we built up, for example, dedicated network like 3G on Shopify, where they kind of set up a network for developers to build. Facebook was known for 2G Tuesdays. I'm not sure how many of you implemented this idea in your work, having a dedicated 2G day where developers are highly encouraged to build and deploy on 2G, right? Um, but at the same time, when we look a little bit broader, this brings us to a place where we have to think about a set or a family of performance budgets, right? We have to think about different conditions. So giving that memory, giving that network, giving that screen, giving that and that condition, what should be an optimal or let's say an okay performance um, budget at that point? Think about slow 3G, slow 4G, slow 5G, fast 5G, Wi-Fi and everything in between. And so there are wonderful tools like, for example, this one, um, performance budget calculator, which allows you to play a little bit with this budget and figure out what's right just for you. And that means that for every component that we're building, for every wonderful React component that we're serving, we have to think how much impact it has on the overall performance. Should we play videos automatically or not on slow 2G or slow 3G? Right? Should we have parallax or not? Should we have web fonts or not? Right? This kind of idea is really, really important. And I think that with Network Information API um, being one of them and Device Memory API being another, we're kind of moving to a pretty good place. Right? And in fact, it's not that complicated, but we need to kind of bring in and think from the design perspective again and the development perspective of how we actually make it work. From the accessibility perspective, we also have um, CSS at uh, the Media Queries Level 5, which allows us to adjust the experience again based on motion, contrast, light level, transparency, and color scheme. Now, I was attending a conference in Prague a month ago, or two months ago. And there was a woman coming from uh, China, from Shenzhen, and she was running a startup incubator there. And she was talking about the experiences they have in China, and she was talking specifically about WeChat, right? And when, as I was listening to what WeChat can do, I was so shocked and amazed by the, the thing. Of course, it kind of drives on the cost of privacy, right? But if you think about machine learning and artificial intelligence, how it's embedded, you can think about you know, every single app you have on your phone, 
bundled into one WeChat app, right? So one of the conversations that was really incredible for me went, how come that somebody sends you a link, right? Or maybe in, you know, in the WhatsApp or Facebook, whatever it is you're using, and you have to go to that link and enter that site in a browser you know, to check out. Why is that? Shouldn't you be able to actually go ahead and check out right in the chat as you're talking to somebody? That's totally normal and just regular way in WeChat, but we haven't even started thinking about it yet. And now the reason why I bring it up is when we look, of course, on the state of things, and especially on what people are using, this should not be very surprising that the smartphone app just surpasses everything. So if we compare mobile web um, and smartphone app, obviously we know that um, more people are using the apps. And in fact, if we look into the most people around the world and where they spend mobile minutes in all markets, it's at least 80%, right? And what really kind of worries me personally, because you know, I grew up with the web and I knew the web being a very different place, is this thing. Well, if you look into the next generation of people coming up, they might not even know what mobile web thing is at all. Because I feel, and I'm afraid, that as we're moving forward, we probably will not have something like just one WeChat and that's it, right? But we might end up in a world where we have just a few big players, big apps that encompass everything, where everything is happening there. And what's really dangerous, I feel, is that you know, whenever I go to Indonesia, because Facebook is providing a service for free, People are locked into Facebook. They don't know the web as we know it, right? And it might feel that this is kind of the experience that we're heading into. Mostly also because the expectations are very different on a mobile device. If we look into the expectation, more than half of all sessions that people have on those phones are 30 seconds and less, and 40% of smartphone app usage lasts less than 15 seconds. Now, if we need like eight seconds or nine seconds to just render our application, we lost already. There is no way for us to survive at this point at all. So we kind of really have to rethink, and not just introduce a performance culture, but think about how can we bring people back. And I think there are a few things that I really want to share at this point. Let me just jump a little. Sorry. Um, because I think the reason why people are not on the web is not necessarily because our applications are slow. It also has to deal, in a, to a vast degree, to the way of how we deal with tracking and privacy. Now, I really asked myself, and it was a really tough year for me, because I decided to do two things. Every time somebody sends me a link to any app, I'm going to go to extremes to read the entire privacy policy before signing up. I was busy every Sunday, right? The longest was Amazon, which took me eight hours, 24 minutes. So how many people read privacy policy for fun? Okay, a few people, a few people. The other thing I decided to do, every time I see a cookie pop up, I'll go to extremes to opt out from every single tracker and measure time, how much time I would need to opt out. How much time do you think I need for? Like, it's really hard for me to go for websites. Don't send me to websites, right? <laughs> so I need approximately 42 seconds to opt out from every tracker. 42 seconds of my time. And don't get me wrong, I'm not privacy obsessed. I'm not I don't have Tors installed somewhere, right? I wanted to find out what it means for average people who care about privacy and what it means for people who don't care. What is the difference if you think about performance? And I asked myself, how come that we ended up here? How come that we ended up in a world where this is normal? We are not laughing about this. This is just normal. We just take it. We don't go to the streets to protest against it. We just take it. And in fact, we build it. Right? And in fact, sometimes, you know, you just click things away and this is just moving forward, right? But then you end up with extremely disgusting interfaces. Oh, sorry, <clears throat> disrespectful interfaces, right? Well, we'll look into this interface and here's a question that's being asked. Do you have children? <laughs> right? And I'm wondering, somebody must be sitting somewhere and designing and building a slider, which is a perfect answer for the question, do you have children, right? <laughs> Because you know, sliders have two properties. One is the minimum value, one is the maximum value. The minimum value is kind of obvious because it's zero, but the maximum value has to be defined, and luckily it was defined by developers because it's five. Right? <laughs> now, if you, have to happen, if you happen to have more children, that's fine because there is a way out. You can click on the pencil icon. That thing turns into an input field using React. Mm, right? You see? We're, we're making progress here. And then you can type in whatever you like in the input field, but the interface will tell you, ah, 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 five. Because the interface knows better, right? Obviously. 
Now, this is all weird and awkward, and there are really evil companies around as well. <laughs> right? Are there any fans of Ryanair? Well, one. Are you working for Ryanair? <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, I'm like an elephant. I never forget, because whenever, uh, a while back, whenever you book a flight with Ryanair, the insurance was added in for you automatically, unless you opt out. But to opt out, you need to find how to opt out, because opting out is conveniently located between Denmark and Finland. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and you might say, so what does it have to deal with performance? Well, I think it's a really critical part of it because performance is all about usability in the end. It's all about user experience. People don't go to websites because this is the average experience, right? And the research I've done kind of proves it in some way. But it goes deeper. Have you seen this Instagram ad? How beautiful. Somebody decided to Photoshop in a hair. So it shows up on Instagram because, you know, people don't like to have hair on the phone. And what, guess what? A-B testing went through the roof. <laughs> Click engagement went through the roof. Retention rate, not so much. <laughs> right? But then obviously it does bring clicks, but is it something that we want to put out? Right? And then somebody says, we can do better than this. Let's add some dirt. Hmm. <laughs> and then, of course, this is a nice example, right? And then what did we decide to do? We can do better. How can we do better? Let's add a nice push notification. Because who doesn't like a nice push notification, <laughs> right? And so my medic would like to send you notifications. And there are two options. You can choose not to stay alive or, you know, get <laughs> notifications. And there was an A-B test. There was an A-B test. It was, I think it was not blocking A-B test. Um, server side and all. But they decided that it's probably a good idea to move away from this to this. <laughs> which performed much better, right? Much, much better. But most of the time, you know, these examples are kind of funny to look at, but it's the state of things, right? And this is really, really horrible. Most of the time, it's mostly invisible. You know, whenever you get this little bubble, I've never been to watch section on Facebook, I get this bubble prompting me to log in or to get in, right? Um, the same thing that happens, you know, with websites showing you, hey, somebody just booked this, or somebody just bought that, right? I'm not going to call out names. Uh, <laughs> But, and it's, it's not this example from another site, but you know, there are scripts around that you can buy, or you can just, you know, they even open source some of them, which can contain names, locations, uh, and then you can type in the product images URLs and prices and all, and it just randomly combines all those things into one, right? Mimicking essentially this fact that somebody is buying something. And you know what really shocks me? That these things, that kind of these plugins, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to show them up that these plugins are the best sellers for on in, um, Envato Market, for example, and others, because apparently it works on human psychology, right? Really, really horrible. Now, when you start reading privacy policy, and probably it's a long conversation, you'll find incredible things. I mean, if you do go and you do read Amazon's web, web privacy policy, this is, first of all, a very lengthy document, but if you go all the way to section 54.10.3, which is an incredible thing, highly encourage you to do that later, you'll find a zombie apocalypse clause, <laughs> which restricts the impact of Amazon, or the, such as the liability of Amazon, in case somebody is using their tools, one of them being Lumberjack, which is used as a game for game engine, to build robots or ninjas or anything of that kind, which will result in the end of organized, organized civilization. <laughs> but if, it, if that happens, they are not liable. <laughs> right? Now, anybody read, anybody used Face app? It was making rounds for a while. You know, somebody gets a, sends me a link, I have to read the privacy policy. It was interesting. It was very interesting. You know what really surprises me? Every time these apps show up, and wonderful apps per se, I'm wondering how come that the interface is, you know, so-so, but they always take it to extremes to create an incredibly lengthy and very detailed privacy policy that nobody understands. Right? And if I look into it, that's just despicable. Right? Not only do you give them all access to everything, like all photos and all of that, right? but at the same time, they can use it in any time, in any way, in any work that they will be building and developing in their lifetime. And, you know, anybody reads privacy policy like, for fun? We just give that access without even thinking twice. Right? What's even worse is that they also place a device identifier that may deliver information to us or third-party partner without asking you. Right? Now, luckily, there is this wonderful service which is called Terms of Service Didn't Read, right? 
uh, which actually provides a lot of information, especially in light of GDPR, kind of need to know what happens to your data as somebody is signing up for your service, right? It kind of provides a really nice summary of privacy policy, which is really, really cool to have, right? But then as things get worse, you know, things get really worse. Now, we, it was mentioned already at the conference, when these things started happening, right, we started fighting back, and customers started fighting back. And for a long time, I thought that it's just me. It's just me having all these ad blockers and Facebook blockers and containers and whatever. But it seems like as I was doing research, talking to students and talking to people, like just regular users this year, in Georgia, in England, in, um, here in the Netherlands as well, it's a mainstream thing. It's becoming a mainstream thing. You will not find any teenager who doesn't know what an ad blocker is, right? And of course, browsers are fighting back as well with things like, you know, um, Firefox blocking third-party tracking cookies and craft mining by default, right? And also showing it, um, like they're doing a lot of work in that area anyway. And Chrome kind of following as well. And then you have Safari um, as well in intelligent tracking prevention and, you know, Edge 2. And it looks like we're moving to the world which is kind of different and difficult. So if you look into state of things today, this is the world as you know, our customers or our users see it. Whenever you get a pop-up model, block. Whenever you get a push notification request, block. Whenever you get chat window pop-up, block. Whenever you get a feedback pop-up, please give us a little bit of feedback, take a part in the survey, block. Install app prompts, blocked. Importing contacts, blocked. Because we know the history with LinkedIn when everybody all of a sudden got spammed. We don't want that. Whenever you ask for geolocation, this is not going to be given, granted, without you explaining why you need it. Then, whenever it comes to GDPR, okay. <laughs> Cookie, consent, that's fine, that's fine. Whenever you ask somebody to turn off a net blocker, there are two established strategies that people adopted, and I thought that it's just me. One of them is going to incognito mode. Who does that? Hmm. Hmm. And the other one, it's very common to have a second browser for other things, right? And so people tend to use that second browser. So getting people turning off an ad blocker is really, really hard, right? Unless you have an extremely valuable information. Access to camera and photos is blocked, microphone blocked, video autoplay, people just scroll by, right? They're not going to watch. Uh, email input, that's a funny one, you know? Whenever, you, let's say, you're in the, at the airport and you want to get into Wi-Fi, and you have an opportunity to sign in with four options, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and email. Mm -hmm. Who would sign in with Twitter? A few people. Uh, one person, exactly one person. Mm, okay. Who would sign in with Facebook? Mm, one person. You, have, you should talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, who would sign in with Instagram? We won't let them in. No, Instagram is our darling. Who would sign in with email? Now, what kind of email would that be? <laughs> hmm, because we have two classes of emails, don't we? We have the email, the darling email, the one that we don't share, and, you know, the other one with newsletters and spam and accounts and anything of that kind. So getting a proper email today, almost impossible. People know how to create temporary emails. People know how to create fake accounts. They're really, really good at this. So getting a proper email is really, really hard, right? The same goes for gender, age, and phone input, because it's very common for people to fake just to make sure that whenever somebody wants to send you a marketing message, that the data that they have is not the right one, right? So will, very often, you will see people typing in fake data just to screw up with you, right? And at the same time, you know, what else do we have? Well, capture. Well, the invisible one, but then we get to see wonderful crosswalks, right? <laughs> That's fun. That pixel, is it uh, already in that uh, square or not, right? And then what I see people saying sometimes, but even less and less people do that, you know, I have nothing to hide, so it's a big deal. So what if Facebook and, you know, Instagram, the same thing. What if, what if they know things about me? So what's a big deal? Well, the big deal is that we don't know where the data flows. This year has been a really horrible year for the age of menstrual surveillance. We are pregnancy tracking apps. We are collecting data and selling them to the highest bidder. Would you like to manager, your manager to find out if you're playing a family or not? Probably not. This is totally out of your control because we sign up and we don't read privacy policies, right? Um, at the same time, it goes deeper than that because you also find health insurance. 
you know, have particular interests about how often you go to the gym, or what you eat, or what you don't eat, or when you eat, right? That's not the business. So all these things are really protecting, about protecting your data from somebody who doesn't have any business of searching for it or looking into it. The weirdest part is that sometimes, because this data can be bought, you find these cases where somebody gets a pregnant ladies list from a data broker and then sends hello emails or, or like uh, uh, congratulations postcards inviting them to a particular company. Isn't that nice? Right, that this data kind of gets leaked. Anybody had this feeling you're talking about something and all of a sudden this shows up on Instagram and WhatsApp and whatever? Anybody? Well, this, as it's proved, it's been proved, the data is being sent approximately 100 times a day. Different audio segments are being sent to Facebook servers, and we are not quite certain why. So it looks like this is not a paranoia. This is something that actually happens. And then I discovered something that was really, really scary. I have to show it, even though we kind of not, don't have that much time. So this is, I'm going to show you a real thing. It's not a scam, right? And it's out there, and it's perfectly legal to have it. So I'm just going to turn it on. I hope that the audio will the play The Spinner well. is a new online service that enables one to control articles presented to a pre-chosen specific individual on the websites he or she usually visits in order to subconsciously seed a message in their minds. That person, the target, is exposed to hundreds of items strategically placed as editorial content, repeating the same message over and over and over again, whether it is proposed marriage, quit smoking, initiate sex, or stop riding motorcycles. How does it work? The basic package offers a set of 10 different articles presented to the target 180 times over a three-month period. The articles, along with their eye-catching headlines, are chosen by a group of psychologists in order to influence the target on a subconscious level. The spinner sends you an innocent-looking link. The link is sent to the target via text message. When the target presses the link, a cookie connected to the link attaches itself to the target's phone. From this point, the target will be strategically bombarded strategically with articles bombarded. and media specified for him or her. The story of The Spinner was covered by Rolling Stone, Financial Times, New York Post, The Sun, and many others. Alongside popular preset campaigns, The Spinner also offers tailor-made campaigns. The most requested tailor-made campaign is Settle Outside of Court, which has now been added as a preset campaign, and Get Back With Your Ex. If you're interested in a campaign tailor-made for your that's incredible? Messages. And you know what really shocks me? This is not a scam. You can buy it for $49 today, right? And that's incredible because it's enough to just tap in like an Instagram account and then they will do the rest, right? Whatever that means. That's just scary. That really is. Now, if you look at this state of things, and of course, you know, I'm not even mentioning things like this, for example, which, which you know, everybody uses. You know, for example, like the ad block and uh, all those things. Um, or stop chat pop-ups, the new, new kind of upcoming thing. And the, my favorite one is track this, which allows you to open 100 tabs, which essentially track uh, target trackers. So they cre create a different person personality of you. Maybe you want to be, you know, stand for luxury and having a couple of Mercedes and stuff. <laughs> Right? Essentially, it shows up, like creates all these 100 tabs, and then you change your personality. You will get really interesting Instagram ads as a result. Highly encourage you to try it out. Right? <laughs> now, I think one important thing that's really critical here is that people don't trust the web, and they don't trust us. Because we actually, in many ways, we're just creating experiences that are not what people want to have. Right? And one thing that's really critical here when it comes to privacy in general is the fact that when we think about you know, our data, we should be thinking about what can happen to our data because we have no idea. Right? For example, would you like your manager to find out that you're looking for a job before you found a job? Probably not. Would you like your partner to find out that you bought to propose from Instagram ads because you looked at you know, maybe jewelry rings? Probably not. So all these things are kind of little things, and I think that Sarah Jamie Lewis kind of really hits it in the nail, because this is day-to-day -day battles that we have to protect. And in fact, that thing, you know, that Shubi was talking about as well, GDPR, is actually there to protect us. Now, who thinks, honestly, that GDPR is a waste of time? That's okay, it's a safe place. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, in fact, actually, I asked myself, so where does it come from? What, is it, what does it mean? Will we see tons of cookie pop-ups now showing up everywhere again, kind of draining on performance one more time? Uh, and it looks like 
it actually has a very interesting history. So the very first proposal and very first directive came from 1995 to protect customers' data. And it's actually interestual, which means it actually acts both in Europe and everywhere else in the world. Now GDPR, which is also a very fascinating material to read on a Friday night, um, is a very lengthy document, and it's actually Article 25 GDPR specifically. Um, it's all about protecting the data as in many different kinds, in many different ways. And data refers not only to cookies, it's not a cookie law, that refers to genetic data, biometric data, and all kind of online identifiers, MAC addresses, fingerprints, RFID tags, and so on and so forth. And I don't want to, you know, to drive you to the introduction to GDPR, that's not the point, but the point is we have to treat privacy as a default. But it also means that we have to be really careful, because if you look into North America, North America has a very different perception of privacy. It's very normal to sign up for a service and the data would belong to the company, but it's not common and not normal in Europe at all. So now we have a conversation about privacy or GDPR or the impact of cookie pop-up, right? Kind of really have to be sure that you're speaking on the right terms. Now, in general, essentially what it means is that we're kind of basing our designs and then our development as well on privacy. I was in these really strange conversations lately, and I don't know where it's going to lead us, but I think it's important for all of us to hear it. Because I was in this conversation, and somebody comes to me, who can work on legislation in the US, and they tell me, why do designers and developers think that they're any special? I'm like, um, wh what do you mean? I don't understand. Well, you know, if you want to be a doctor or lawyer, you know, you go to school, you get the license, you know, you, and then you become a doctor or a lawyer. Developers, everybody can wake up in the morning, look at a couple of React tutorials and say, I'm a developer. I'm a developer today, right? The same goes for designers. You can just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm a designer today, right? But we have a lot of responsibility. So the proposal from their side was then, shouldn't designers and developers like regular people you know, go to school, get a license, and once they get the license, start practicing design and development? Who would be comfortable with that? Then you're hiring, right? Well, maybe 15 people or so. I think that many people would find it quite uncomfortable or strange and unusual. But again, if we look into impact, you know, this spinner, this spinner thing, right? It's just out there, it has an incredible impact on society potentially and on people around you. And it just exists because there is no legislation kind of tricking, trying to break it down. And I think it's important that these kind of things kind of start getting into, um, under control, let's say. Now, I won't go into all of that, that's not so important, but I want to see kind of where we're heading with this, all of that. Um, one important thing, by the way, that's really critical is that customers have the right to be forgotten. And very often, we don't even know what that means. If you install and plug in your third-party scripts, that's your responsibility as developer to know what happens with the data. So when that request, the GDPR request, comes in your way, it's your responsibility to send that request or forward that request to third parties that you're using to ensure that that data is stored. Or you might end up having a little GDPR lawsuit against you, right, if you can't prove that. That's not something we should treat lightly, right? Now, of course, when this thing, when uh, GDPR came into force, it was implemented in a really poor way. It was never the idea behind GDPR, but this is the world in which we ended up with. And I think that this is why we hate these cookie pop-ups and we find them quite useless, because everybody just clicks them away. Now, the fun part about this one is, on New York Times, it doesn't matter where you click, it's always the same thing. It's not like you have a choice. By a clicking I accept button, or cross in the right upper corner on this banner, or using our site, uh, you consent to the use of cookies unless you have disabled them. This is not a choice, right? It's like you can turn them on and turn them off, right? Um, and in fact, of course, this is not GDPR compliant, but you might say, so what? It's not like, you know, somebody is going to go to US and file a lawsuit against uh, New York Times because they're not GDPR compliant. Well, it depends on how it's going to be treated. If it's a bigger company, it might be blocked in European Union because it's not respecting the rights of European citizens, right? So this is kind of what we're risking. And as I mentioned before, Oh, sometimes it's so crazy, all the things that we come up with just to save cookies. I mean, this is incredible. This is one of them, right? And not only do we have like 500 trackers sometimes, sometimes it would go all the way where you have to tap like an accordion and then potentially select and opt out and opt in. And then you know what the best part is? The saving of these settings takes 43 seconds. When you click on that button to save, I hope you will see it, you know, the processing is running. 
unbelievable, right? And all these things are kind of happening everywhere. And this is no wonder that some websites, you know, do this. Your website is not um, available in our country. So people who came from the North America, are you excited about the appearance of cookie pop-ups no. in Europe? No. no. Oh, yes. So the thing is, is it really the future? I was in another conversation, and that conversation went like this, you know, because you have very specific rules for children in the U.S. as well. So whenever there is a news website, and a child might go to that website, right, you probably want to have parents consent so they can access that site. So the idea was, shouldn't we have something like GDPR, but just for age as well, so you can verify that somebody is old enough to enter the site, right? And we do want to have a cookie pop-up, install app prompt, newsletter box, and then an age prompt as well. And then the new discovery in the world of design for cookie pop-ups is this one. Cookie settings, and by GDPR, according to GDPR, only necessary cookies are allowed by default. Whenever you need more data, you have to ask permission to get that data. You may not collect any data without that permission, right? Um, well, necessary is opted in by default, which is fine. Uh, statistics, comfort, and personalization are not. But then, there are two buttons, actually. One, select all and confirm. <laughs> Isn't that nice? And one, confirm your selection. And it's been widely adopted, and you'll find it in many different cases as well. This is one, I think, from, you know, from Netherlands, if I'm not mistaken. Allow all cookies, or you know, manage cookie settings. Right? So is it really the future? Is it where we're heading? Well, there are good patterns as well. The thing is, whenever it comes to push notification, whenever it comes to cookie pop-up, the one thing that people are really OK with when they're happy to give you data is when you explain why you need this data. That's very critical. We should not show a push notification prompt at the point where we don't know if somebody is going to click on it and you know, kind of act on it or not. We should show a push notification only at the point when we're certain that the person is going to say yes. And that means we need to initiate a relationship or build trust with somebody entering the site. Right? So this is why, by default, I think the way forward would be is to not load anything, only necessary cookies, as time passes by and somebody maybe access two or three pages or so, only then we can slowly, gradually ask for more and more data as time passes by and ask those questions only when we're certain that we're going to get that permission. And we also have to explain why we need a particular data. Right? What happens on that level, on the other level, and on the advertising cookies level? Because no, people don't mind sharing, cookies for, uh, sharing data for advertising purposes, but they mind tracking. That's something that they don't want to have. Right? So if you explain in nice terms, helpful terms, why you need this data, this will be, uh, you might receive that data after all. Right? Um, now, just as a light, nice little note here, which I think is important to mention, there is a big discussion happening in European Parliament as of now about the future of that cookie pop-up. And in fact, what I was really quite happy about is the fact that it's been considered, it's been understood and realized that, um, for example, the consent rule to protect the confidentiality of mm, failed to reach its objectives as end users face requests to accept tracking. So the European Parliament has understood that this cookie pop-up doesn't work. Right? And there are different options that have been considered. And one of them is to kind of look into how browsers actually deal with do not track settings today. And they don't want to bring the not, do not track header back. I mean, it's already in browsers, but it's just Safari pulled out from it. Um, but the idea being, in the future, two, three, four years from now, we probably will not see cookie pop-ups at all. Instead, it's supposed to be legal, legally binding for browser makers. I don't know how it's going to work, though, but it's a proposal that's coming in to adjust or to set up a setting on a browser level so once you install a new version of Chrome or Firefox or Safari or anything, you will have to make a choice how much data you would like to share. And based on that, this is going to be advertised as a header to websites and applications, and it will be your responsibility as developers to respect that. That means that according to, like, in addition to everything that we covered so far, the network, the memory, the screen, we probably need to think about different designs for different levels of personalization and tracking and advertising. Right? And in fact, if we look into the simplification rule that's coming up seemingly next year, um, and I think I'm going to just read it out. I just need like two more minutes, and that's it. The cookie provision, which has resulted in an overload of consent requests for internal users, will be streamlined. The new rule will be more user-friendly, as browser settings will provide for an easy way to accept or refuse both options. That's very important. We have two options, accept and refuse, tracking cookies and other identifiers. The proposal also clarifies that no consent is needed. That's important for us. No consent is needed for non-privacy intrusive cookies, improving internet experience, 
like to remember shopping cart history, a cookie is used by a website to count the number of visitors, which is analytics, right? So it looks like we're moving in a better shape where things are getting actually much better. And so this is why I'm really confident that we're actually moving in the right direction. Now to wrap up, I skipped a lot of stuff and I focused on privacy, although I didn't want to. But I think there are really a few important things to take away from this. You know, we had a really a couple of wonderful days discussing all kind of little details about performance, what we can do to improve things, and so on and so forth. Um, but if there are no users coming to our sites, then it all doesn't matter. Right? So we really have to make sure that we're kind of bringing this trust back that we have lost. Not we, but all of us have lost. These are all the wonderful things that we learned, and this is just a really short summary of it. Right? We have to think about adaptive serving, we have incredible technology coming up. It's not going to you know, close the performance gap, but rather widen it, mostly because we have so many people using different fragmented devices out there. Um, we have to translate performance metrics to business vocabulary. We have to increase stability in our layout and measure and target reflows. Um, WebAssembly and WebWorker, we can also use them to really offload, make things faster. We can prefetch routes based analytics. And we need a cleanup, right? All of this mess that we have around, it really needs our help. And I would love us to go ahead and build really nice things like this one, which really changed the world and make it a little bit better. You might wonder how blind people deal with everyday challenges. Well, normally the answer is simple. They're not that different from you. We play music, we go to school, we go to work, you get the picture. But sometimes the simplest things can be difficult and we need a pair of eyes. Connect to first available helper. That's where you come in. Through your smartphone, <coughs> Be My Eyes connects the blind with sighted people through a live video connection. Simply choose if you need help or want to help by the click of a button. That's a nice picture of you and your family, Caroline. Is this well present? <laughs> yes, it's a photo from my parents. You can help just by installing the Be My Eyes app. Image. And we'll notify you when someone needs your help. And if you're in the middle of something, don't worry. Someone else will step in. So now it will, I would feel really uncomfortable if I knew that I created a service or built a service that might use the personal data of most vulnerable people for in a way that would be just you know, horrible. Um, that would make me feel very uncomfortable. Just one more positive thing, because it was a really sad video. Uh, this is the story of my life. I always show it, to be honest. I think we can do a lot of things in performance, but the best part is that it's never perfect, and I think it really is the best part. Um, we can always try, because the world is unsatisfying. Thanks to Pearl Studio for the wonderful, wonderful video. With this in mind, let's make the web better because we can. Cats, cats, and meow, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>